Stephen, middle initial A, Benson, B is in Bravo, E N S O N. And Dr. Benson, uh, what do you do for a living? I am a licensed psychologist in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I see you uh, kind of set up and put some stuff up on the uh, on the ledge there for y for your reference. Is that right? That's correct. I would just ask that uh, you have the computer screen up right now. I can't see it, and Mr. Hahn can't see it. So, is there anything that you have up on that screen that you're going to be reading right now? No. Okay. So, if you do, for whatever reason, reference something you need to do on the computer, just let us know so that we can make sure that we know what it is you're referring to if there's anything along those lines. Does that make sense? Sure. It's just a copy of my report. Okay. Um, and then same thing, I know you had a three-ring binder there and probably lots of information in that as well, right? That's correct. And so again, if you're going to you need to refresh your memory or review something, just let us know. No, but we just want to make sure that we all know we're on the same page. Yes. Literally in that case. <laughs> um, so I'm showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 711. Uh, can you tell the jury what that is? Uh, this is a copy of my curriculum vitae, or otherwise what most of us would call a resume. It simply documents uh, my prior education, uh, past honors and awards, uh, my license as a licensed psychologist in the state of Wisconsin. It also details my professional memberships in the American Psychological Association and also in the Wisconsin Psychological Association. And so it let, also me, let me ask you just a couple yeah. of questions about that, if yes, I could, yes. okay? Um, just your, uh, when I ask you about your education, in particular just your undergrad and then your, uh, your master's and your, your PhD. So did you, did you get a college degree? I did. Where did you do that? I graduated from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. And when was that? In 1978. And uh, what was your major then? Psychology. Did you uh, go on and get a uh, master's? Is that what the MA is for? Uh, yes, I completed a Master of Arts degree at Luther Theological Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay. And then uh, following your master's, did you go on and obtain uh, further education? I did. Where'd you go? I completed my PhD at the University of Nebraska. Where my field of study was clinical psychology, and from there I went on and completed an American Psychological Association approved residency at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. Okay. Is it after that then you became a uh, licensed psychologist? That is correct. Are you, you're a licensed psychologist here in the state of Wisconsin? Yes. How long have you uh, been licensed here in the state of Wisconsin? Uh, since 1987. And I know on here you also have uh, your professional experience, and I'm sure there's um, many details we want to go into, but for now, can you just give us kind of a broad stroke summary of your employment, I guess, over those past uh, 30 sure. years or so? Sure. Uh, I worked for the first uh, four years at North Central Healthcare in Wausau, Wisconsin, after I completed my PhD. Uh, North Central Healthcare is a community mental health center and inpatient psychiatric hospital and also a rehabilitation and uh, a senior citizens living facility. I also, after that, entered into private practice and I was in private practice since 1990. So I entered into private practice shortly before I left North Central Healthcare. And in that uh, capacity, I worked with individuals, I worked with couples, I also worked with families, both in inpatient and outpatient settings. Did you do any forensic work as a part of that? Uh, my initial forensic work actually started back in 1981 when I was at the University of Nebraska. We have a joint PhD JD program there. And as part of that program, I was a member of the forensic assessment team. And so when you talk about forensic work in your field, what does that mean? Uh, forensic work at that, uh, well, what I typically take it to mean is that I was dealing with uh, cases involving competencies, uh, looking at the question of uh, criminal responsibility, uh, also looking at guardianship issues, and also looking at psychological evaluations to provide a diagnostic picture of, of the person who was being charged with a crime. Okay. 
Um, I think I interrupted you when you were talking about your professional experience. Was there anything else that uh, you were going to add before I cut you off there? Uh, uh, three years ago, I started working, uh, moved from doing uh, part-time uh, practice of for doing forensic work to doing uh, full-time forensic work through the Wisconsin Forensic Unit. What's the Wisconsin Forensic Unit? Uh, this is an agency that is uh, contracted with the state of Wisconsin to perform competency evaluations on whether or not a criminal uh, defendant is competent to proceed to trial. And in those situations, so if... Uh, if a court wants to appoint an expert regarding the, uh, what we call in our field a 971-14 or a 971-15 evaluation, uh, do they pick somebody that's on that forensic unit team? Uh, oftentimes, yes. Not, not exclusively, but oftentimes. Okay. And how many uh, professionals are within that forensic, the Wisconsin forensic unit? Um, Approximately. Approximately, I would say 15. All right. And you're one of those 15? Correct. Have you been uh, appointed um, in this neck of the woods uh, yes. to do evaluations by courts? Yes. Um, in Eau Claire County? Yes. Just name some of the other, again, counties in this neck of the woods that you've been appointed by judges. At uh, Chippewa County would be another one. Uh, Russ County would be another. St. Croix County would be another. Trempolo. Uh, would be another, um, Grant County would be another, uh, I'm not recalling any others at this point. But you go across the state, would that be fair to say? Uh, places outside of Madison and Milwaukee would be fair to say. So in what, what I think uh, those of us that live in this area, that everybody else down south calls it the northwest corner of Wisconsin, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, it's a pretty big area, but... But once you get outside of Milwaukee and Madison, you cover that whole area, right? I have done cases in that area, yes. All right. Um, move for the admission of Exhibit 711, Your Honor. Any objection? No. Exhibit 711 will be received. Um, showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 712. Is this a copy of your report that you made in this case? Just checking here because of their blacked out sections, and I just want to make sure we're on the same page, literally. I'll give you a copy that you can refer to with the, the portions that are, um, as you said, uh, crossed out. Does that make sense, Dr. Benson? Yes. Is that uh, Exhibit 712 appear to be a copy of your report with some redactions? It is a edited version of my report, yes. Okay. Uh, move for the admission of 712, Your Honor. All right. Um, 712 will be received. And ladies and gentlemen, there are redacted portions on the exhibit. And uh, the parties uh, have reached an agreement that those portions that have been redacted are not relevant uh, to this trial. So uh, it's something that you should not speculate about what is redacted, and uh, but the report is received for what's relevant. Okay. Council satisfied with that? Yes, thank you. <coughs> yes. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 713. Uh, is that a addendum to your report that has additional information regarding uh, your diagnosis and opinions in this case? That is correct. Again, move for the admission of 713, Your Honor. No objection. All right, again, Exhibit 713 will be received, and again, uh, there are redacted portions of that, and the parties agree that those portions that are redacted are not relevant and not admissible uh, in this trial, and therefore, uh, I ask that the jury or 
instruct the jury to disregard any redaction or to speculate or wonder what was redacted. All right, so I want to, you're certainly welcome to look at your report, but I want to just ask you some questions about what you did in this case, okay? Yes. Um, were you hired to do an evaluation uh, of Ms. McCandless and answer certain questions? Yes. Did you do that? I did. All right. Um, and in your report, you talk about, uh, I believe, you list sources of information. Is that in your report? Uh, yes, there is a section entitled Sources Information. So um, is one of the sources your interview of Ms. McCandless? Uh, interviews? Yes. Um, and in your report, you list um, how many times that you'd met with her? Uh, the report, three times. Um, since the completion of this report in March of 2019, have you met with Ms. McCandless again since then? And I see you're using your computer. So One moment, please. I just need to check on that. Dr. Benson, while you're just, can you I have just know what you're looking at? Yes, I'm just looking at the times when I met with uh, the defendant. Okay. And I wanted to make sure I had the exact dates. So I previously met with her in addition to what was specified in the report of March 18th of 2019. I also met with her on March 30th and also on October 5th. So you've met with her uh, five times? That is correct. Okay. In the March 30th, was that in 2019? That is correct. And the October 5th, that was? Uh, 2019. 2019, 20-some days ago, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, and were the, each of those five times, was that a what you would consider a clinical examination? Yes. What's a clinical examination? It simply means that I'm looking for evidence from a diagnostic standpoint now, when I use the word evidence, there's a difference between a, a psychological or psychiatric concept of evidence and a legal concept of ed evidence. And so for my purposes, I was looking for evidence of diagnostics, looking at what clinical diagnoses may be present to describe Ms. McCandless's current functioning, and then also looking to see if there have been any changes over the period of time from when I first met with her on May 8th of 2018, when I met with her most recently. Okay. So, um, under the diagnostic clinical interview, you have listed the three meetings, and now we've learned about the two other ones. You also list a uh, neurobehavioral status examination. Is that right? That is correct. What is that? It is a standardized uh, process for establishing, does the person know who they are? Do they know where they are? Uh, do they know uh, the time, the date? Are they oriented in time? And do they understand the purpose of why we are meeting? Okay. It also looks at a number of other things relative to uh, presenting mood. It also looks at executive functions like memory. And it also looks at what we call uh, thought organization, thought processes to see if there is any evidence of any formal thought disorder that would qualify as mental illness. Okay. Um, and you also list on there a consultation with the Dunn County Jail Nursing and Correction staff. Is that right? That is correct. So is that something beyond just reviewing records? Uh, it would have been simply posing the question to them, how is she doing? Okay. And again, we can't get into the content of what somebody else told you. Mm -hmm. But just you've spoke with other people who had been with her, around her. That is correct, in okay. addition to reviewing the medical record. Okay. Um, Judge, maybe it's easy. Can, do I have permission to just publish as I go through this, put it up on the Elmo? Is there an objection to that? Is there? Not if it's on 712. Yep. Agreed. It's on 712. I'll just grab 712 and we'll put it up on the screen. All right. And I think everybody can follow along with you. And I don't, I'm fine with the lights being on. Excuse me. Um, Judge, my preference is to just keep the lights on unless you want a different. I don't know if you want to ask the jury if they can see it with the lights on. I don't. Yes, yeah, so anybody feel they need the lights on? Okay, nobody's indicating they want the lights on. 
Okay. And so up on the, the screen there, uh, Dr. Benson is the Exhibit 12, 712 that you see, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so we went through the sources of information, diagnostic, clinical interview. Was there also some testing that you did? Uh, yes, there it was. And again, they're listed up there. Can you just tell us what each one of those tests, what's the, the, what's the first test? The Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, uh, fourth edition, is a measure, an objective measure that is based on norms of similar adults of the same gender looking at intellectual functioning, which has to do with things like verbal comprehension, uh, ability to reason, uh, cognitive processing speed, and working memory, which has to do, think of working memory as being like problem-solving memory. And on Exhibit 713, which I believe you still have up there on there, that's the addendum that we previously talked about. That's the detailed results of that test. Is that... That is correct. Okay, and so we'll get into the actual results of that later. The, the WAIS to fourth, did you do that one time, two times? When did you do that? WACE four. WACE four. WACE four. We're going to teach you how to talk like a psychologist today. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm not sure who will appreciate that <laughs> other than you, than you but uh, <laughs> when did you uh, administer that test? That was on May 8th. Okay. Have you done it um, since then? Uh, I only did it the one time. Okay. And the purpose in doing that is that's typically a test because it's an ability-based test that it's sufficient to do it one time as long as it's within the past year or two. Okay. And then the MMPI-2, what is that test? The MMPI-2 is a 567 item forced choice. And what forced choice means here is that a person reads a statement and they have to respond to the statement as either being true or false as it relates to a description of how they tend to think, feel, or act the majority or 51% of the time. Uh, what it gets at are a number of different types of uh, diagnostic con uh, conditions, and it's a, a diagnostic tool that is recognized as the gold standard in doing any type of a, a clinical assessment. And when did you administer that test? Uh, that was administered on May 8th. And the MCMI-4, what is that? Uh, that is a, a, another forced choice uh, inventory that looks at personality features or what we would prefer to recall, refer to as the more enduring traits of character or personality, meaning when you see a person, what are the things that tend to be consistent about them from one time to the next? When did you administer that test? I administered that both on May 8th and then again this past October 5th. And why would you administer that test two times? Because one of the things that that particular, and again, this is not a test, it's an inventory. I apologize. Uh, the WACE is a test because the WACE has right and wrong answers. The MMPI-2 and the MCMI-4 are inventories in that they register the person's preferences or way of looking at what happens around them. The reason for administering it twice is because one of the things that I'm concerned about whenever I meet with somebody is I want to make sure of the accuracy of what they're reporting. And so one of the things that I look at uh, across the course of those different uh, interviews has to do with credibility. It has to do with whether or not there is some attempt to malinger or feign uh, to represent themselves as someone that they're not. And so the MCMI-4 has a, a link to different types of personality disorders. And I wanted to see if any of the ones that were linked to the presence of malingering were evident on the results of her MCMI-4s. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit more later about those results and, and uh, how they impact your opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to get the initially here. Uh, so thank you. And then I believe you have the... Uh, post-traumatic distress scale, is that right? Uh, yes. What is that? That is a clinician-administered uh, interview that follows the criteria, the diagnostic criteria in the uh, DSM-5. And then based on those criteria, it makes ratings in terms of the frequency of those criteria as they're experienced by the person that is completing the scale. Okay, and when did you administer that scale? 
I uh, administered that on uh, the initial uh, appearance uh, with uh, Ms. McCandless on May 8th. And then I also administered it um, back in uh, this, uh, back in this uh, last month on October 5th. Not this last month, but on October 5th. Okay. Yeah. And then lastly up there is the, uh, this one is a test, or at least it's labeled as the Wisconsin card sort test. What's that? Wisconsin card sort test is a neuropsychological measure that is com uh, computer administered. And what's important about this measure is that it is sensitive to prefrontal uh, functioning in the brain. The prefrontal cortex is what we refer to as the executive center of the brain. Uh, the executive center is where we make decisions. It's where we weigh possibilities. And it's where we look at uh, what possible actions are available to us. It's also available to us in terms of retrieving memories that could be useful for what to do. When did you administer that test? Uh, that was May 8th. Then I'm not going to get into the details, but it, it has on there, and I believe continue to the next page, review of legal documents. Is that right? Mm -hmm. fair, to say that, yes. fair to say that you've reviewed thousands of pages of documents? Or at least you were provided thousands of pages of documents? I have two hard drives here that uh, I reviewed. Okay. I, won't, I didn't do an exact page count, but something like that. Okay. So I want to move on to um, at the bottom of page two. You go into a section that's uh, called clinical findings. Is that right? See it up on the screen there, Doc. Yes. Okay. I want to ask you about that. Did you, to a reasonable degree of professional certainty in your field, come up with, have an opinion as to her diagnosis? I prescribed uh, two different diagnoses for the defendant. The first was post-traumatic stress disorder with depersonalization and derealization, and I also diagnose the presence of persistent depressive disorder with anxious distress. And that I know is uh, referenced eventually here on the last page just because I'm jumping ahead a little bit. On page 8 of your report uh, under the paragraph diagnoses that's what you're uh, referring to there is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, so when we go back to page two. Can we approach real quick? Sure. So I, I believe I was asking you about, again, I, just to, I lost track myself, so I apologize if I'm repeating, but you were going over your uh, diagnoses here from page eight that is up on the screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And then on page two of your report, you have a section called clinical findings. Is that right? Oh, that is correct. Okay. And so I want to go down and talk to you about this sentence here beginning, it is my clinical opinion. Okay? Yes. So uh, you put on there, it's your, can you just read that sentence, I guess? Maybe that's the best. What, it's your clinical opinion that what? It is my clinical opinion that she continues to experience the events. And this is in reference to uh, why we're here today. In the form of intense and distressing recollections, the avoidance of exposure to the cues that resemble or symbolize aspects of the event, recurring nightmares or flashbacks, and persistent depression. Okay. And so, what's post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, what we look for in that is that it's defined in the DSM-5. What, and I'm going to cut you off. I apologize. What's the DSM-5? DSM-5 is this particular book, which is everything you want to know about uh, diagnosis. It lists all the diagnoses that we currently use relative to mental disorders. And there is a specific section in there. Uh, that's entitled post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's also titled uh, stress-related disorders because there's more than one. 
And in that particular section, it outlines the diagnostic criteria that are associated with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So before we get into the criteria for diagnosis, just in broad strokes, you know, we hear the term PTSD or what, what's post-traumatic stress disorder? What, what is it? In just layperson's terms, if you can. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, the first thing that has to be present is that there has to be a credible threat of serious injury or death or sexual violence. That has to be met first. That's the first criteria. And are these criteria, again, that are in the DSM-5? That is listed in DSM-5. That has to be met. It is an exclusive criteria, and it has to be met first before you can go on to the other criteria. What are the other criteria? Without going into all of the specifics on them, the other criteria have to do with intrusive symptoms. Think of this where you have thoughts that come into your mind without wanting them to be there. They simply are popping into your awareness, or their intrusions, or their unwanted recollections, or their flashbacks. Uh, the second part of that, of those criteria, has to do with avoidance, where you don't want to be reminded of something, where you try not to think about it, you try not to talk about it, you try not to have feelings about it. And then the third part of it has to do with uh, the fancy phrase that's used for it is autonomic hyperactivity. And autonomic means that it's not something we have conscious control over. It's involuntary. And so these would be things like uh, tachycardia, heart racing, hyperventilation, breathing very rapidly, uh, increased perspiration, typically a sign of stress. Uh, that's the sort of thing where, again, there's a sense of feeling um, an interior sense of being charged up or energized or tense. Those would be the three criteria that we look at for okay. basic criteria. And I know your uh, diagnoses had um, the term with depersonalization and derealization. And so um, I want to get into that in more detail later, but that is a part of your diagnoses. Uh, that those are in the DSM-5 one of the things that it asks for there and it asks for there are modifiers that can be attached to the diagnosis and Those are two of the modifiers that can be attached to it. Okay, so before we get into the details about kind of the Criteria in which you evaluated Ms. McCandless for regarding PTSD Do we need to know a little bit more about depersonalization or derealization or can we talk about that later? You tell me um, well, let me put it very simply. Uh, basically, with depersonalization, it's a feeling of being outside of one's body. It's a sense of observing yourself as if you're up in the corner here, looking down, watching yourself as you're doing something objectively as you live your life. So it's a sense of being kind of stepped apart from, or sometimes we use the, the colloquial, everyday language of saying, he was beside himself. Uh, that, in a sense, references the notion of depersonalization. Derealization is a sense that what's around us doesn't feel real at the time of it being perceived. So it feels like it has a sort of fantastic quality to it, or as if it's not grounded in reality, or as if it's not quite objective, or something that can be touched or felt or sensed. Is that, I've heard the term surreal, is that similar? Surreal could be one word you could use for it. Okay. So... Back to the diagnosis about, uh, or the description about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, did you evaluate Ms. Uh, Ezra for that? I didn't uh, go into the uh, initial meeting with Ezra, with Ms. McCandless, with a particular diagnosis in mind. Uh, that's not the way clinical assessment works. Okay. A clinical assessment is a process that we call it an actuarial assessment. And what that means is that we use a combination of clinical interview data and also objective test data, looking at you know, what, uh, what type of diagnostic conditions best explain the person's behavior that's being, uh, that I'm being asked to look at and to provide some understanding about. So just if I get this right, it's, it sounds like it's a gather information, 
and you go through a process with that information to come to a, for lack of a better term, a, an opinion or a conclusion. Or a, a conclusion would be a good way to look at it. So it's a gathering information. And as the information is being gathered, you look for what I call a convergence of findings. That uh, typically when you're looking at who the person is, you're listening to their answers, you're looking at the results of their testing, things start to funnel down to the point where we then come up with, okay, here's what I think we have based on what's been provided to me. And that might be the opposite of, say, reaching a conclusion and then going looking for evidence to support the conclusion. Yeah, I don't do those kind of evaluations. Is that something, have you heard of the term confirmation bias? Of course. What is that? It's where you, well, it's essentially you've already defined it. I mean, it's where you go looking for something that you've already determined is there before you've met with the person. Okay. And is that, it sounds like that's bad practice. Uh, it's an unethical practice. Okay. And so in this case, you met with Ezra to just gather information? That was the initial intent, yes. Okay. And at some point, upon meeting with her and the tests and the other information, you came to this diagnosis? Or diagnoses, yes. Diagnoses, apologize. Um, what role did your <laughs> clinical interviews with her play in your diagnoses? Well, that's, uh, that's critical because one of the things that you look at with actuarial assessment is that you are trying to understand what is the context for what got the person there in the first place. And when we talk about context, it's not just a matter of what is the presenting issue. Uh, context is also determined by what goes before. And so be, at that point, it'd be important to get a good sense of history, comprehensive history, uh, talking about important events that have preceded the event in question, talking about uh, past styles of addressing those types of events, how much resilience was present or lack of resilience. In essence, trying to put into some sort of picture, who is this person and how are they likely to respond when stressed? And what's the important, you said you again, five times, what's the importance of, why didn't you just meet with her once? <laughs> Well, that certainly can happen where there's only a one-time meeting, but I think that this is a fairly serious issue here that I was being asked to draw some conclusions about. And one of the things that I always look at when I do a forensic assessment in particular is that the reality is, is that people lie. And so one of the things that I do in terms of trying to examine the possibility that I'm being presented with a story that may not be accurate is that I prefer to do multiple interviews because the context for that, the reality is people tend not to remember their lies. And so when I'm sitting with somebody for two hours or four hours or the one day I sat with her for eight hours and took notes for that entire time, uh, I have all those notes available to me over that uh, approximately 18 hours that I met with uh, Ms. Candace. So. This brings me to the term malingering. Have you heard that term before? Yes. What is malingering? Uh, malingering has to do with a person presenting a picture of themselves that is not accurate or realistic. Is, Typically, they present that picture for some type of secondary gain or benefit. Is, uh, are there other terms that are commonly used or commonly perhaps thought of in conversation that are similar to the, the clinical sure, term malingering? Sure. What would those terms be? Other terms that are used, uh, one would be feigning. Typically feigning, F-E-I-G-N, is meant to symbolize some aspect of trying to present that you have a diagnosis that in fact you do not have. Uh, other terms that are used are fake bad, where you try to present yourself as having every diagnosis in the book in a sense, or a significant number of them. Another term that is frequently used is fake good, where the person tries to present themselves as being overly virtuous or possessing the kind of values that would never allow for any type of wrongdoing. Uh, in essence, a, a fake good profile would be similar to saying that uh, they could never do anything wrong. Is that, uh, in your 30 years of practice, do you consider malingering when you meet with people and make evaluations and offer diagnoses? Judge, I'm gonna object and I think I need an explanation on a sidebar. All right, Mr. Nelson, uh, you may continue. Dr. Benson, I want to ask you some questions about uh, 
the three, what I, his, his opinion. from information he learned after the report turned over to the defense on March 18. Okay, so you follow that, Dr. Benson? I do. Okay, so that's what we'll do. Are we ready for the jury? Or do we now, anyone need a restroom break, or can we get through this? I would love this? to do that if that's okay. Like, two minutes. Do you well, if Ms. McCann's, Ms. McCandless needs a break, then we have to do a recess, and we're going to need 10 minutes. Right? I'm fine. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you five minutes, but please. I won't even be five minutes, Judge. Okay, okay. all right. Can we start with that? You, you can start without me, too, if you want. Okay. I prefer to bring the jury in, because they've been out. I hate to keep them waiting. Okay. Let's bring the jury in. Okay. Please be seated. All right. Mr. Nelson, uh, you may continue. Dr. Benson, I want to ask you some questions about uh, the three, what I've got, at least the three sets of symptoms regarding post-traumatic stress disorder. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that, uh, I think you'd previously testified about these sets of symptoms. Is that a good term to use or is there a preferred term? That would be appropriate. What are those, so the first set of symptoms, can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, those are what we call the intrusive symptoms. And what does that mean? And those are defined by having distressing recurrent thoughts uh, that come into awareness without being bidden, without being asked for, without being contemplated to simply appear. Okay. Second part is having bad dreams or nightmares about the traumatic event. The third one is reliving the trauma as if it's happening all over again. The fourth is feeling emotionally distressed when reminded of the trauma. And the fifth is experiencing physical reactions. Again, when reminded of the trauma, like breaking into a sweat or chest tightness. So these are the, the five, what do we call these? The five uh, sets of symptoms regarding that first category of symptoms? The five symptoms that are indicative of intrusive recollections. Okay. Um, you uh, met with uh, Ms. McCandless on... Uh, May 8th, December 15th, December 16th, and you made out a report regarding how her those symptoms that she had uh, had, is that right? Yes. Did she uh, display, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether she displayed the, any of those symptoms regarding that intrusive and distressing memories? Uh, yes, I do. What is that opinion? With respect to the unbidden distressing thoughts that came into mind spontaneously. That was a daily, multiple times daily occurrence. With respect to having bad dreams or nightmares about the trauma, uh, she specified four times per week. With respect to reliving the trauma as if it was happening all over again, reliving the event, uh, that was specified as weekly, one time per week. With respect to feeling emotionally distressed and reminded of what occurred on March 22nd, that was multiple times daily. 
with respect to the experience in the physical reactions, that was uh, multiple times daily. And now you had, it's, you showed uh, uh, the different hard drives or thumb drives of additional information, is that right? That is correct. And then you, which included uh, medical records um, re surrounding Ms. McCandless on March 22nd through, I think it was the 27th, is that about right? Yeah, at Mayo Systems, yes. Uh, as well as uh, medical records um, from staff, uh, including nurses uh, here in Dunn County, is that right? That is correct. Uh, social worker and nurses here in Dunn County. Um, and is that something that you check to are you looking for collateral sources of information other than just Ms. McCandless's reporting of this? It's a rule of practice that whenever I do a forensic evaluation that I consult collateral sources, uh, which could include uh, past medical records. It also could include persons who have ongoing contacts uh, with the defendant. You did that in this case? I did. And did that confirm your uh, opinion that those intrusive and distressing memory symptoms were present? I have one technical issue here. Uh, the diagnosis of PTSD was referenced with what occurred with the assessment that occurred at Mayo Health Systems. But by definition, uh, the part that we did not get into is that you do not look at a diagnosis of PTSD until 30 days after the event. So I want to follow up on that, and so let's put that to the side. I understand, but I just wanted to get... I appreciate that, but putting that aside, mm -hmm. and I think you're talking about Dr. Bartholow's opinion within those Mayo records, is that right? Uh, his name was Atasha, but it wasn't, uh, I believe that there are other names attached as well to those okay. records. And so, again, without, I don't want to get into the content of that now. So let's put that aside. Understood. The other collateral sources that you looked at, mm -hmm. did that support, did you use or consult that to support your opinion? It was, remember before I used that image of a funnel? Uh, that was all information that went into the funnel to see what was going to come out at the bottom. And so to answer your question, that would be information that went into my consideration in order to determine what I felt was the most accurate diagnosis given the experiences and perceptions that have been reported to me and the records that have been provided to me. Okay. And now I do want to talk about this uh, without getting into the content, but it sounds like you're critical of an opinion based upon the timing of when that opinion was given. Is that I'm right? Object relevance. I think it goes to, well, let me, I'll back up. I'll I'll back up. Right, I'll well, sustain drop. the objection. When you're evaluating the criteria under DSM-5 for post-traumatic stress disorder, is there a timeline that you are to consider? Yes. What's that timeline? When there's been a traumatic event, uh, typically there is, if you look at the uh, section of the DSM-5 that has to do with trauma, uh, there are different diagnoses that are available. And so the first diagnosis that you would look at is that whenever there has been something which is defined as a disruptor, this is a very broad category diagnostic, but it's done this way because the belief is we need to gather information in order to understand what happened. So the first diagnosis would be an adjustment disorder, which means some disruption in personal, social, occupational, emotional functioning. The second fact that one would look at, or the second diagnostic category, would be an acute stress disorder. But one doesn't begin to look at that until after three days have passed. And that's a point of practice that's defined by the DSM-5. I mean, as, just as a legal professionals, you have points of law, we have points of practice. And then we begin to talk about PTSD after a lapse of 30 days or more. So there's, in that first 72 hours, Based on the DSM-5, there's only certain diagnoses that are even permissible. Is that fair to say? With respect to a traumatic event, yes. These stress disorders, which is all we're talking about, or, or the traumatic event stress disorder. Correct. Okay. And so within that category, there's, some, there's, there's limitations in that first 72 hours. That is correct. But unfortunately, so, sometimes people tend to jump 
they tend to jump ahead instead of paying being mindful of the time limits that are imposed by the DSM. Okay, and so before I, why, why is that? Why is there this limit uh, that 72 hours to say, look, don't go do something too quick in that first 72 hours? Why? Because the reality is, is that not everybody who's exposed to a traumatic event necessarily develops PTSD. There can be other responses as well that are equally valid. A person can become depressed in response to a, tra to a traumatic event. They can become anxious in response to the event. They can become dissociative, and by dissociative what I mean is that they, in a sense, block any remembrance or awareness of that event so that it's not accessible by memory. And they can also have what we would call a somatic disorder, and again, I apologize, this is the language that I have to use, but what it means is that certain uh, physical parts of the body are seen as being highly distressed, but it's the kind of thing where that distress is seen as being or interpreted as being indicative of some type of underlying psychological difficulty. So for example, if a person were to have uh, an unremitting headache, that would be an example of a somatic symptom that could be reflective of an underlying psychological issue. If a person were to have some type of GI distress, one of the explanations for that can be that that's indicative of an underlying psychological issue. Or, we know from the research studies that have been done that fully one-third of all presentations at emergency rooms for cardiac problems are actually due to anxiety, where the anxiety is so intense that it mimics the person having a heart attack. So why, why does the DSM-5 say wait 72 hours? Because I think it's reflecting that there needs to be time to gather information it also reflects that when you have a traumatic event, it's kind of like it takes the experience, um, what could I compare it to? It's kind of like taking an experience and ripping up a piece of paper and throwing it up in the air so that it no longer is a coherent piece of paper, it's no longer a whole piece of paper, and then trying to gather it all back together again. Or it's like taking a deck of cards and flipping them and so they all scatter across. Because a traumatizing event is one of those things that by very, the very nature of the event is that the person's ability to understand, to comprehend, or to perceive what just happened is compromised by the very intensity of the event. So the DSM-5 recognizes that and says you shouldn't start an evaluation or come to a conclusion in those first 72 hours at all. Well, at it's, least it's regards to post-traumatic stress disorder. What I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. What I would say is that it's saying that when there's been a traumatic event, the biggest mistake that's made from a treatment perspective is people try, uh, treating professionals, try to rush the person through to get better as quickly as possible. Or they try to rush to judgment as far as this is what we're dealing with. But in fact, you need to allow enough time to pass in order to know fully how is the person responding to the trauma? What is the diagnosis that's specific to that trauma? Because diagnosis drives treatment. So this piece of paper that's torn up and thrown in the air and scattered around, does that need time before that can get put back together in a cohesive manner? The way that the literature, the research literature that has been developed with respect to the issue of PTSD is that again, the biggest mistake, as I said earlier, that's made is trying to push a person too quickly to recall what occurred. So tell you- me, Tell me more about that. What do you mean by push a person too quickly to recall? Trying to ask them to recall events prematurely before they're ready to describe them in their totality. And the danger in doing that is that there's something called secondary traumatization. And so if you push them to recall the event too quickly, you actually, from a professional, from a treatment point of view, run the risk of re-traumatizing them. Because as you heard from that first set of symptoms, without even taking into account this, the second two sets, is that one of those things that's happening is that there are episodes of reliving the incident as if it's happening all over again. But then as a treating professional, you then ask them to recall the event. Uh, to me, that borders on malpractice especially if they're not ready to recall it, because that's the part where you're pushing the mind 
when it's already dampened down the emotion associated with this terrible event, you're pushing the mind to say, we don't care if you're dampening it down. We don't care if you're trying to suppress it or repress it more accurately. Tell us all about it, which is just another form of re-traumatization. Okay. That's not acceptable. And so that's this, to just, I want to come back out of that, I guess. Sure. What we were talking about regarding this different diagnoses, and you had to wait until 30 days to, according to the DSM-4, before you can get to a post-traumatic stress disorder. Correct. Okay. And so part of what you had looked at is reports, and you were critical about whether or not those guidelines had been followed within some of the records that you reviewed regarding some of the treating professionals. Objection relevance. It's sustained in relevance. This is this is not about treatment, Mr. Nelson. So okay, I'll move it's on. It's not ahead. relevant for the purpose that. for which this witness has been called to give testimony. Okay, you just to, you reviewed some records. Um, well, let me just I'll just move on. Mm -hmm. The second um, the second set you talked about was I labeled as persistence avoidance. Is that a fair title for the second set of symptoms? regarding post-traumatic stress disorder? Yes, the sense that there is a persistent sense of avoiding reminders, yes. Tell me more about that. So that one is composed of six different uh, sets of symptoms. Uh, one is trying not to talk about it. And this takes something which you know most people tend to use as far as normal, normal uh, psychological functioning. It's what I tongue-in-cheek call the golden rule of Midwestern living which is that if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. Okay. And so, but what happens when there's been a trauma is that this issue becomes intensified. So instead of it just being, oh, a bad thing happened, I got a bad grade in a test, I don't want to talk about it, or I didn't pass my course, I don't want to talk about it, or I broke up with my boyfriend, I don't want to talk about it. This is the kind of event where you cannot suppress an awareness of it because it's continually breaking into your consciousness. It's continu you're continuing to see flashbacks. From my point of view, it's what we call Polaroid moments. Um, for those, maybe I'm too old at this point. I, we still had Polaroid cameras when I was younger, but they're po Polaroid moments for like these photographs that would develop within two minutes. You mean like an image flashes in someone's an mind? image flashes and you see everything that happened. And then you have all the, the physiological recollections that go along with it. So you were listing the, the persistence avoidance. I think you'd listed the first one. Yep. And then you try to avoid activities or people or surroundings that remind you of the event. And then you try not to remember it, which is basically just a way of saying, I don't want to think about this. Okay. I can't contemplate it. It's terrible. So what's the fourth? Fourth one is having less interest in participating in activities. There's a loss of pleasure and things that have been previously enjoyed. Fifth has to do with feeling numb, emotionally numb, and cut off from other people. And the last one is a sense of, I'm sorry, fifth is feeling distant or cut off. The last one is feeling emotionally numb. Okay. And um, do you have an opinion that you put in your report of March 18th as to whether those uh, avoidance uh, symptoms existed in, uh, as part of your diagnosis in this case? Uh, yes, I do. What's that? Again, in my report, I documented the frequency of their, of their occurrence, and I listed the frequencies uh, in my report. And if you wish for me to review those again, I can do so. In the report, I think, speaks for itself, and maybe this is a good time while we go through those. I can put that up again. So just uh, page four of the report. Just so we can, uh, I'm going to go quickly here, but on page four, you listed to begin with uh, the intrusive symptoms. That's what we went through before. Is that right? That's correct. Oops. And let's go there. And then um, you also got this avoidance of symptoms uh, that you just talked about now, and those are what's listed in your report. Is that right? That's correct, except there's number seven, which is on my next page. And that's the one that you can see there as far as the sense of uh, the future plans are not going to be, or dreams are not going to be realized. Okay. And so now again, in, in your uh, report, in, in uh, 
coming to this diagnosis, did you consider collateral information as well as just as well as your interview with Ms. McCandless? Uh, I did consider it, uh, but what I'm focusing mostly on here is repeated interviews with her. That's the purpose for doing the three different interviews on the date specified on my March 18th report. And it's also looking at it in terms of the psychological testing that I performed relative to diagnostic formulation. And the purpose in doing that is because of the materials that I had reviewed, nobody had done that type of comprehensive assessment. Now, you'd also, I'm sure, do you have Exhibit 290? And uh, 176, I believe it is. When you have been uh, marked and admitted to evidence here, as Exhibit 290 is a transcript of uh, interview two of Ms. McCandless on March 24th. You're, I know you don't know it by line by line, but you've seen that before. If not that exact copy, you've uh, certainly had a transcript of her interview with Investigator Proc from the 24th? Yes. Okay. And uh, conclusions from the, yes. All right. Uh, I want to turn to page, I believe it's 55. Um, and on line 2491, I want to ask you some questions about that. This, this excuse me. And on line uh, 2491, there's a question that's asked of Ms. McCandless why she didn't uh, ask Mr. Proc about it, and her answer was, it was too scary. Would that be something that would fit into one of the categories that you just talked about? It would. How so? Judge, I just ask for an accurate reading of her response, please. Sure. I I summarized, but the exact words, the exact question as it shows up there and as part of Exhibit 290 is, the exact question was, you're just now, how come you didn't tell me this yesterday when we talked, Ezra, question, and her exact response was because I didn't, it was too scary. Judge, again, it says it was, it's too scary. Agreed, it's an exhibit. Okay. I, yeah, but it's up there, I, the jury can see it. Thank you. Clarity, but it's sustained or noted. Uh, okay. Is the answer that you see up on the screen, is that something that would fall into one of those categories? Sure. How so? Well, two ways. One is it's reflective of the fact that she does not want to, in a sense, re-experience the trauma. It's an avoidance. But the other aspect has to do with what we know about trauma, which is that when a person is first traumatized, which is when this interview occurred, uh, within the first 72 hours, that the way that trauma is incorporated into memory is that it's not immediately available for conscious recall. Now, over the course of time, more and more elements of that experience will be recalled, but it doesn't happen that quickly. Okay. I want to come back to that, but I want to follow down on the transcript here. She's then um, gives another response um, that's up on the screen and her response is uh, because it was just because it just was scary and I can't get it out of my head. Do you see that on the screen? Yes. Does that also fit into any of these categories? It does. How so? Well, it's again, it's a fact that the scariness refers to the avoidance aspect. When you're scared of something, you typically don't want to move toward it. Also, is that what occurs is that when you can't get something out of your head, I mean, that's the very definition of the intrusive set of symptoms. I mean, you can't get it out of your head. Okay. And then I believe I want to... And on page 61 of that same uh, transcript, Ms. McCandless makes a statement... At line 2771... Uh, that I'm putting up on the screen. Uh, do you see that, sir? Yes. Um, and can you just read that? Because apparently I'm having trouble reading. So can you read that for us? 2771? Yes, please. What shows on the screen? And it was just so scary. Everything was just so scary. And I don't know what to do about it. Did you want me to continue to yes, speak? please. I don't. It's just so scary, and I just want... 
can't get anything out of my mind. How, if at all, does that fall into any of the categories that you've been talking about? Well, I think it's, uh, it simply reinforces what I've already stated. This intrusive memory um, matter that you've been talking about? That's correct. Uh, on page 55, uh, it was right back where we started, sorry. Line 25... Zero four. Uh, there's. Uh, can you again read uh, what Ms. McCandless says in that transcript? And it just keeps replaying and replaying and replaying. And I wish it would go away. How, if at all, does that fit into your any of the categories that you've been discussing? Uh, again, it'd be evidence of the intrusiveness of the events. Okay. Going back into uh, her awareness, or at least the visual scene of it. Okay. Now you. The third set of symptoms um, you talked about was this, I, be I believe, uh, marked alterations in her physiological arousal and activity. Is that, is that sure? The, sure, it's uh, or hyper arousal. Tell me about that. What that has to do with is that we, what is examined or what is asked about, is sleep pattern. You know, whether or not there is insomnia where it's difficult to fall asleep or stay asleep or to have a satisfying night's rest, or hypersomnia where the person is sleeping uh, much of the day, uh, far beyond seven or eight hours that we would normally expect. Uh, the second symptom would be a heightened sense of irritability or anger. Third is having trouble concentrating uh, to the point where this is the executive function piece where there's evidence of having difficulty with focus, sustained focus, and being able to inhibit getting distracted. Uh, the fourth part is being overly alert. It's what we would call an exaggerated startle response. Someone comes around a corner and it's not just a matter of, you know, jumping as would obviously happen with most people, but it's like a huge response, much more than what one would predict. And then the fifth one has to do with, again, at that being easily startled or jumping. So again, in your report, you uh, list on page four the, those five categories and the information that you'd received uh, from Ms. McCandless. Is that right? That is correct. And again, did you consider collateral sources at all for those? You know, I have to say, I don't recall that because that was something which had more to do with after, this was a month after, I mean, well over a month after the event. And so as it became apparent that I was looking at PTSD at this point, the collateral sources did not have the kind of information that I needed. And so the, what I have, we have listed here, as you can see, this is all information you'd obtained during your May 8th clinical interview. Is that right? Uh, um, yes, that part there is correct. Yes. And we went through those three. And then on page five, you do a similar um, listing of these uh, based upon your December 15th meeting with her. Is that right? That is correct. And then again, you go through the intrusive symptoms, the avoidance symptoms, and the hyperarousal symptoms, and those are all included in your report. And I'm trying to show a consistency of response here. I mean, it's not everything is exact, but I'm trying to show that there's a consistent set of responses, and that what I'm looking for at that point is I ask for details. I'm trying to see, is there, again, a convergence of the narrative about how the defendant perceives these different aspects that are indicative of PTSD? Okay. What, if any impact or effect does a person's past trauma have in regards to uh, your di a diagnosis of PTSD other than the perhaps what I'll call main event? The implication of past trauma is such that what occurs with that from what we understand from the research literature is that the more traumas that have occurred previously, the more easily it is to become re-traumatized with future or 
trauma that follow after the previous ones. Okay. And so this is something which has been well established. Uh, we've, the whole notion of re-traumatization is problematic because there's no guarantee that when someone's been through one trauma, like say for example, if they've been through a, a sexual assault, if they've been through a second sexual assault, it's going to bring memories flooding back, not just from the, the second assault, but also from the previous assault. Likewise, if it was a motor vehicle accident and they're involved in a second accident where say somebody was seriously injured or killed, they recall not just the first, not just the immediate accident, but also the accident that occurred previously to that. So when you start stacking these up on top of each other, you know, when you start putting more and more of these out on the table, uh, basically what happens in terms of neurochemistry is that the person becomes much more easily traumatized. So let me ask you about the, the depersonalization and derealization aspects of your diagnosis, okay? Okay. You talked a little bit about it um, before. Is this, uh, is what you're talking about, is this an altered state of consciousness? What happens with that is that you are not processing what's going on around you as if you're currently grounded in reality. That's correct. Tell me a little, what do you mean by not currently grounded in reality? It means that basically what's happening is that when we talk about the depersonalization aspect, it feels as if you're observing yourself or you're removed from yourself. Would be, you know, to keep it in down-to-earth terms here, I mean, there's a sense of being beside yourself. You're observing yourself as if you're outside of your body. Uh, it feels like you're not currently present or being able to operate. It's as if you're distant from yourself. And is there... Um depending upon, just in general, is there an awareness of this at times? I mean, is somebody aware of their depersonalization or aware of their derealization? Typically, it's something which there's not always an awareness of it. Uh, I can tell you in terms of treating individuals with this condition that there can be a developing awareness the further out from the traumatic event treatment is occurring. But typically, there is not an awareness of it happening, and this is referred to as losing time or losing awareness. Or it's like someone says, well, you were doing this at this particular time, and the person responds, I have no memory of that. I'm losing time. Okay. And that's literally what they mean. They're losing blocks of time where they have no recall. Does this altered state of consciousness, is this a voluntary response, an involuntary response? Is that the wrong way to categorize it? Uh, it's not necessarily the wrong way to categorize it. It's basically, this is the response that's imposed by the exposure to the trauma. That there is this huge dampening of awareness. And again, this is meant to be a protective factor in order to give the person time to sort of reassemble what happened. What do you mean by, like a, what do you mean by protective factor? Trauma, by its definition, is something that's viewed as being so intense that it's overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that it makes you question whether you should oftentimes even consider living. It's so overwhelming that it makes you feel as if you may not want to go on living. It can be so overwhelming that it makes you feel as if, you know, this whole thing just seems unreal. I can't believe what just happened. You... I've heard you use the term before, and I don't know if this is a, the right place to put it. I've heard you use the term regress under stress. That, yes. Does that have anything to do with what you're talking about here, about a, 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 this response to trauma? It does. Tell me about that. Well, the example that I saw, at least in the records that I reviewed, is that uh, very shortly after the trauma occurred, is that uh, Ms. McCandless referred to herself by her previous first name. Uh, she did not use her current name. And so it's oftentimes the case that when you put a person into a very traumatic or highly stressful situation, that they're not able to function appropriately because it's usually something that they've never encountered before, or something that they never contemplated before, or something that they've never had any practice with addressing before. And at that point in time, again, the mind's response is to basically shut down because it's overwhelming, it's so intense. And that's where it goes back to either earlier memories or earlier ways of functioning. The recall of the previous first name is an example of that. And so that's what you mean by the term regress, is to kind of fall back to some previous default? 
it's to fall back not just to a previous default, but it's a fallback in terms of not being able to respond adaptively in the moment. Okay. So now I, uh, this is probably a horrible analogy, but regressing, uh, I'm not even going to go there. I, Mr. Nelson, I, I don't know how much more time you're planning on, but I don't know. I, know, I don't I believe that Dr. Benson's planning to come back tomorrow, and we have a time limit here, and you have to have enough time for the state to cross-examine. So as interesting as it is, we've got to get to it. I'm going to either that or put a time limit on you. So, okay, let's move it along. How would uh, a prior depersonalization or derealization experience impact or affect somebody's response to trauma? Well, it's going to make them more susceptible to it. How so? The, by virtue of the fact that whenever a person is traumatized, it becomes much more quickly available to them. They're reminded of all the prior traumas. So it's not just the immediate trauma that they're reminded of. They're reminded of past traumas as well or past events when they felt overwhelmed. There was, there was, it, the experience was just so intense that it was difficult to conceptualize or to put into words. Is it, have any, the phrase well-worn pathway, does that have anything to, to do with a prior derealization experience? Well, that's what we talk about from a neurochemistry standpoint, is that when we talk about these pathways that are associated with trauma, with the trauma response, we know that there are areas of the brain that are basically going to respond each and every time there's exposure to trauma. But I have to probably say that, again, I'm a clinician who treats patients, and I think you have somebody coming up, Dr. Hopper, I believe, who is more of an academician who can talk about those neural pathways. You know who Dr. Hopper is? I do. Uh, is he a recognized expert? Objection relevance. Sustained. We don't have time for extras. You do have time, Judge. I'd... Well, let me ask you this. Um, Mr. Hunt, how much time do you need for cross-examination? I guess it depends on how much longer def uh, defense counsel goes. All right. Well, I, don't, I don't think it'll be all that long, to be honest with you, but I don't. it depends on where we go from here. Okay. I, I... I mean, you can continue. I just, we don't have time for extras that are not relevant to this witness. Okay, so let's go. Can I ask the question? I mean, it was the... the, the well, the last question was about Dr. Hopper, and yes. I don't think... He'll be here as a witness, so we don't need to talk about Dr. Hopper. Yeah, can I, I apologize, but I can we approach on the side, Judge? <sighs> Staying on, de, on uh, the depersonalization, derealization, I believe you put in your report a sentence talking about a causal, causal perspective. You remember that? I do. Can you tell us about that? Basically, that uh, dissociation occurs as a result of exposure to traumatic events that are overwhelmingly distressing, and it serves as a what is termed a psychological dampener of the intensity of those emotions in order to um, protect that person from that dis intense distress. So what you're talking about now is what I think I have on page six, the paragraph that we're, the causal connection between, whoops, I'm on the wrong one there. I think you're right. Here's the one I wanted to ask you, but I apologize. The sentence uh, talking about the more severe the trauma. Yes. Can you read that sentence and tell us about that? The more severe the trauma, the greater the likelihood that the person will be driven by the experience into an altered state of consciousness. So what do you mean by that? So if you were to look at different kinds of trauma that a person could face, I mean, one type of trauma might be an involvement in a motor vehicle accident. I mean, certainly it could overwhelm some people's defenses where they feel overwhelmed by being involved in an accident and having their car totaled. But that would be very much in contrast with the kind of trauma that would be faced by a soldier in combat who's faced with imminent death 
or by a person who's being sexually assaulted or a person who's being assaulted violently in a physical manner. Uh, there, are there are degrees of trauma. I mean, that, that's simply the way it is. And so, depending upon the degree of trauma experienced, that is correlated with the amount of traumatization that occurs. I mean, that's just the working understanding that we have, and that's what the research is bearing out. Now, is is everyone's response to trauma the same, or is it unique? Does it depend? Uh, there are differing responses to trauma, and as I mentioned earlier, not everyone is exposed to trauma, develops a diagnosis of PTSD. There can be other diagnoses that apply as well. But the part that we don't know, I mean, we have to be realistic. There are some things that we don't know scientifically. We don't know what's the difference with respect to why one person develops PTSD in response to trauma and someone else develops a depressive disorder or a somatization disorder or dissociative identity disorder. Can you categorize any particular response as normal or abnormal when it's in response to trauma? Uh, the response that I can say is normal is the one that occurs immediately after the trauma, which has to do with the fact that the person needs to collect themselves to appraise what happened, and just to give time. I mean, again, when you think about the very nature of trauma, is so intense that it's overwhelming. And so what is needed most particularly at that moment is that you need to have a sense of safety. You need to have a sense of sanctuary, or you need to feel like you're surrounded by the love of people in your family or your close friends. That's what's most important immediately afterwards. Later, we'll pick the pieces up. But the mind has to be given time to recollect those pieces. This is what we call trauma-informed care, which has only now become more popular and more used within the delivery system in the past few years. So would you agree that individuals' response to trauma is unique? That is a unique, uh, it's unique, although there are some things that we know are likely to happen, but we can't tell which path they're going to go down. Okay. And some of the things that are likely to happen are what you've already talked about, the, the three symptom, the, the, the three sets of symptoms, those are likely. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how about self-cutting? Self that can also occur. That's been well established in the research literature as a response to basically, as odd as it may seem, one of the things that I do as a psychologist is I look at what's the protective nature of symptoms. And if you're feeling overwhelmed by something, and if you cut on yourself, and again, a cut may be a very superficial cut, just enough to cause pain. If cutting actually produces a sense of feeling in control of your body at that moment, that is adaptive. So it's a different way of thinking about normal functioning. But this is one of the ways in which the person begins to take back a sense of control. Okay. Now I want to move on to what I was talking about before where you'd... Um... Oh. Yes, thank you. The sentence here, uh, beginning with the concept of disassociation, is described as the disruption or discontinuation Continuity in the normal integration of one or more aspects of psychological functioning, including recall memory, identity, and consciousness. What does that mean? Well, this is a response to an article that was published by Spiegel and his colleagues back in 2013. And it's a little bit wordy. I don't always like the way other people write. I would prefer it be a little bit more down to earth. But the basic part of that means that there can be altered states of consciousness where they're not aware of immediate events or experience. It means that there can be difficulties with recall memory, or recall memory is not reliably available. And the third part that you see up there is that there can be identity disturbances where a person feels as if they don't know who they are. That's the whole notion of depersonalization. Okay. The, tell me more about that. You don't know who you are. It's simply a matter at that point in time that this is a sense that something has happened to me that I never fathomed could happen to me. How could this have occurred? How do I make sense out of this? Because it's so totally outside the realm of experience up to that point in time that there's no framework for understanding it 
or for being able to praise it? Or what do I do in response to this? And that, that could result from the causal perspective into this altered state of consciousness. That's correct. Okay. Um, you talked about an exhibit um, 713, the, what I think of it as an intelligence scale. Intelligence test, yes. Some people think of it as an IQ test. Is that what That's, it is? Yes. Um, so on exhibit 713, as I'm putting up on the screen, are these the results of that um, <coughs> test that you administered to Ms. McCandless? Those are the results as administered on May 8th of 2018. So, um, and I know it's up on the screen, we can see it. Can you just walk us through, you don't have to read line by line, but just the, the four uh, parts at the bottom, verbal comprehension and on from there. Tell us about that and what each of those means. Okay, so the first thing I have to say here is that there's not an overall IQ that's listed there. It uh, actually is up in the first paragraph but the problem with that is that there's so much variability when you look at the factor scores that make up the overall IQ, ranging from the, a standard score of 69 on working memory up to a score of 110 on verbal comprehension. And so what verbal comprehension looks, so what we, how we interpret that, well, let me do this. I'm gonna, before we get to the overall, and I know you wanted to do that, let's just, we go verbal comprehension sure. and then go down and then we'll kind of sum it up at the end and you can tell us what 84 means or doesn't mean in this context. we Will do. Verbal comprehension is a measure of a person's uh, range of vocabulary, their ability to engage in abstract thinking, and also looking at range of information available to them. And her score there was a 110. And a 75th percentile. So a percentile simply means that if we were to take a random sample of 100 people, she would fall within the top quartile, the top 25%. Perceptual reasoning looks at uh, basically puzzle solving, being able to see how things fit together, looking at eye-hand coordination, and what we see here is that her score is at a 79, and this is at the 8th percentile, so again, taking that Suppose sample, random sample of 100 people, she would be eighth from the bottom. Working memory, this has to do with executive functions, prefrontal cortex. This has to do with making decisions, being able to recall relevant experiences when faced with the problem. And what we see here is a standard score of 69, second percentile. Again, that random sample means she's second from the bottom of those 100 people at that point. As she, when I measured her back on May 8th of 2018. Cognitive processing speed just simply indicates how quickly and efficiently she's able to process information, how quickly, how sharp she is in her thinking, and where she falls in that sample of 100 people is she's 14th from the bottom. So this is low average ability. Uh, these are not good scores with the exception of the verbal comprehension. So I wanna come, I'm gonna come back to that, but I know in your report, you make mention of the connection between uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and the uh, scores on this scale, is that right? That is correct. How does, tell us about that, what's the connection? Basically what's happening here is that the working memory has relationship to this notion of recall. It's talking about, it's not giving me specific information, but it's telling me how well is this functioning right now when faced with a unique problem-solving event. And so what this information tells me is that it's not functioning. Now, this, that's a part where it's concerning to me because when you look at this, this is consistent with the research literature that we talk about a trauma happening. The ability to think in the moment is compromised significantly. And that's reflected, was that reflected in the test scores uh, that you saw? That is, that is correct. How so? Because of the fact that we're looking at the sense that on verbal comprehension, that's relatively immune to the effects of trauma, and she scored in the high average area, 75th percentile. That's great. But then we look at the working memory piece, which is the part you would think would be most affected by her exposure to trauma, and it fits beautifully. 
that this part became, in a sense, incapacitated. It became an almost, well, by, I would say disabled, okay. not knowing how to respond. And there's a carryover effect to that that continues forward. And that, this was done on May 8th. Of 2018, correct. So approximately 45 days after the event that we're here talking about. Yes. How is, maybe I'm using the wrong terms here, and maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow with somebody else, but is working memory the same as like a person's memory about past experiences? Is that different? Is it the same? Is there a distinction? It's different. How so? And the way it's different is that we talk about working memory, which is again, like I said before, pro problem solving memory. When you're faced with an immediate problem, what do you access in order to solve the problem? On the other hand, episodic and remote memory is our experiences that we've had in the past that are simply there and available for use, but that's its own kind of memory. So if you were just sitting down saying, I remember when, that would be an example of accessing episodic remote memory. So there's a connection though between the two, between working and episodic or remote memory. Working memory pulls from that episodic memory when it needs it when things are working properly. So is working memory, again, this is my layperson's, the ability to hold certain information in your head at one time while you're processing and having a conversation and worrying about what other people think and all of that? Is that or you have to solve a problem and you want to come up with a solution and be effective in doing so. Okay, and that might be different than what you call episodic memory. Correct. The person remembering about what they did in a in an event, uh, I remember years. when my first child was born. Okay, and that might have that's not necessarily related to your working memory, correct? Uh, unless perhaps there was trauma involved in some way, unless I was having a second child and I was taking my wife to the hospital and she's delivering in the back seat and I stopped the car and proceeded to deliver the baby. Okay, that would be working memory, all right, based on what I saw the first time. Now Cycling back to what your initial, we're talking about the overall, what I think of as overall IQ when somebody is presented with a score like this on 713. Is this, are you able, do you think, to give an overall IQ based upon these results? No. Why not? Because one of the things that we talk about, and this is again, uh, not only a warning from the test publisher, this is a very objective test. It has thousands of people that's been normed upon. And the, the warning from the publisher essentially is that when you have this much variability, so you take the highest score of 110, subtract the slowest score of 69. And so, you know, we're looking at that point of basically 41 points difference between the lowest and highest score. The overall IQ becomes suspect when the difference is 18 points. So we're at 41 points. This is a huge difference. And so what the warning is at that point is that you cannot interpret an overall IQ when you've got that much variability. I mean, we're almost, I'll use a statistical term, but it may not have meaning. It's the three standard deviations. It's a huge difference. I mean, this isn't just a little bit of difference. This is like this much difference between that high score and low score. So overall IQ does not make sense in terms of talking about the, the defendant's uh, intellectual functioning. Okay. Now, this was done on May 8th, after whatever happened on March 22nd. Yes. Would this, would you or anybody else be able to say, well, what somebody's IQ would have been on March 1st or March 15th or March 20th? Because I'm going to object relevance. Just staying in relevance. Okay. talked about how, uh, I believe at least a little bit, how trauma may impact memory. Mm -hmm. Could trauma impact behavior as well? Yes. How so? Well, if you go through and look at, I think the, this is why I went through and specified the frequencies in terms of looking at the post-traumatic 
distress scale is that many of those things that are on there are behaviorally specified. And so you can see what the changes are in behavior following a trauma because those, many of those, all of those events are indicators of trauma. And so we're looking at the behaviors would be a sense of this, you know, when you're going through, if you've ever witnessed somebody go through the traumatic event right in front of you, I've, I've had the, I won't call it a privilege, it's actually quite scary. But if you've seen somebody reliving a trauma as if it's happening right in that moment, uh, it's something you'll never forget. I mean, it changes, the, it changes them in terms of who they are as a person, and you can't see them in the same way. I really think that it's, it's difficult to imagine that if you haven't ever witnessed it personally. In terms of the be other behaviors under avoidance, I mean, again... Judge, I'm going to object yeah. to cumulative. We've gone through this list in detail. And I didn't mean to... Sustain uh, and cumulative. And again, if uh, the testimony we anticipate tomorrow will be cumulative to what we're hearing now, then... Uh, so how much more time do you need? I'll give you that time, and then the clock is up. So how much time you need left? You said a little while ago we're past that point. I believe I said at 22 that I needed 20 minutes. I okay, to 4 o'clock then, however you want to use it. Well, do you, um, what's the term inter-evaluator reliability? Inter-rater? Inter-evaluator reliability. Where are you at? I'm, it's not in your report. I'm just asking you about that term. Oh. Have you heard of such a term? Uh, not inter-evaluator, typically. The phrase that's usually used that I've ever come across is inter-rater reliability. Okay. What is that? Reliability is looking at the issue of that when you measure something, are you likely to get a similar or the same measure the next time you measure it? Okay. So it's asking the question of how reliable are your measures. Okay. Uh, is it... Con well. Do you have an opinion whether the information that you reviewed regarding Ms. McCandless's behavior on March 22nd, 2018, post-traumatic event is consistent with your diagnosis? Uh, it's listed in the conclusions section of my report, and that is to the requisite degree of professional certainty. Just so we can do that, then let me just finish up with the conclusion then. Your conclusion was, is listed on here. Uh, to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, it's your opinion that Ms. McCandless's difficulties with PTSD, depressed mood, impaired executive skills, poor recall mel memory, following the events of March 22nd, are most likely the result of what? Of the traumatic circumstances associated with the death of Alex Woodward. Oh, I'm going to repeat that. You can read a little louder in the oh. microphone. I'm sorry. Are most likely the result of the traumatic circumstances associated with the death of Alex Woodworth and the historical presence of prior traumatic events. And how is this type of traumatic uh, stress demonstrated to impact brain functions. Is that what you put in there? I did. And so what ends up happening, again, I'll defer to Dr. Hopper on this because he will talk much more extensively about hippocampal functioning post-trauma. So and let's the, let's do that then. I don't want to... I, don't I wanna... think that would be fair. Okay. And then you talk about studies indicating extreme psychological or physiological stress. Is that the same? What you're talking about here is how trauma impacts the brain? That's correct. Um, and then again, you go on to talk about how that may impact somebody's ability to do all the things listed there, plan, read, learn, or even recall information. Is that right? Especially when triggered by reminders of or behaviors that resemble past uh, trauma, yes. 
those are the only questions I have um, for this witness, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Hahn, you ready for cross-examination? Yes, yes, Judge, thank you. Dr. Benson, I want to clear something up for the jury um, before we really dive into a few things. So post-traumatic stress disorder, you talked about the different criteria, so exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. That doesn't have to be occurring on the person or to the person that is suffering from the post-traumatic stress disorder, correct? Do you need me to rephrase since you... I do not need you to rephrase. Okay. Uh, what it states explicitly in the DSM-5... Is that a, is that a correct statement? What no, I said? no, it's not. Okay, please explain. Is that there has to be exposure to actual or threatened death, exposure to serious injury, or exposure to sexual violence. And then it lists four different ways in which the exposure has to occur. And that's what I said, right? Uh, you left out the part about sexual violence. Okay, I apologize. That was unintentional. My, my point is that doesn't have to be directed at the person who is suffering from PTSD, one of those different categories, correct? They could be observing it happen with some someone else or something else, yes. Okay, so, so it doesn't have to be directed at that person. It could be something they're seeing in real life, correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, your diagnosis of PTSD with depersonalization and derealization has a, I don't want to say a caveat, but a, an additional component. It says childhood onset, correct? Uh, what's happening there is that you're in the wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just page eight of your report. That was. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. That was part of your diagnoses, right? Just a minute, please. Sure. That's yeah. Yeah. I see okay. Where, I see where you're at now. I thought you were still back in the DSM. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't clear. Now. Um, Childhood onset, what does that mean in the context of this diagnosis? It simply means that there was something that occurred in childhood that was traumatic. Okay. Now, different things could constitute traumatic events. I think that's pretty clear, correct? Yes. So you could be a wartime traumatic event, right? Combat veteran, yes. Uh, it could be a, a sexual assault <laughs> traumatic event, correct? Yes. Uh, it could also be an unprovoked uh, stabbing of another person that could cause the stabber to have PTSD, correct? You know, that's the difficult part. I went back and I looked at the research literature on this. And I cannot, I mean, I looked at what's out there and there's a, there's a very, 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 excuse me, very little about that particular event. Would you it's, agree, I'm sorry, would you agree so, that... May I finish? So the research studies that looked at that indicate that they cannot make that association. Because I raised the same question and that's what I, yeah, you know, I was intrigued by that. Now, PTSD in and of itself isn't going to cause somebody to lie, correct? That's not one of the, the things listed in the DSM-5. It's not going to in and of itself make somebody lie, correct? No, that's not quite accurate because you have to look at lies as being lies of commission, which are voluntary, and lies of omission. So let me, let me rephrase it then. PTSD in and of itself isn't going to cause somebody to say something to somebody else that's a lie, correct? I'm having difficulty with the form of your question because it doesn't quite fit the experience of PTSD. Well, you just said that there are, you're drawing a distinction between lies of commission, which would be an active lie, correct? Mm -hmm. And is it just for the court reporter that's a yes? Uh, I'm sorry. Just yeah. for the court reporter. Yes, yes, yes. 
and a, and a, a lie of omission, which would be withholding information, correct? Again, it'd be involuntary withholding of information. Okay. But what my question is, so you drew a distinction there for a reason, right? For a reason, because there's a one part with omission where they don't have access to it just because of repression of the memory. But if, the somebody, other, has, if somebody has access to it and they tell somebody that's not true, that's not explained by PTSD in the DSM-5 or what you've testified to about today, correct? I appreciate you pushing on this because I think it's an important point. And the best way I can answer you uh, is to say that I think that there are difficulties with this diagnosis with variable recall. Sometimes I remember one thing, sometimes I remember another, but it's not intentional. That's why I'm, I'm trying to be as clear as, as I can with you about the nature of the diagnosis because most people and, don't and let get me, that. It, if it is intentional, if somebody acknowledges, yes, I told somebody something that's a lie, that's not explained by PTSD, correct? You're pushing for a distinction here that I think is not warranted by the clinical picture. Is and the let me just put it. I believe that you just said there's a, dis, there's, there's a difference between somebody intentionally and unintentionally telling somebody a lie, correct? That's one part of it. But then when it comes to the commission part where there's an actual lie that occurs, what I'm saying is that there may be a part where that's intentional, but there may also be a part where they don't have, where they say one thing because they believe that's what the case was based on what they can recall now. Okay. Is it fair to say that, well, let me step back. Um, PTSD can be caused by, as we established, all different types, types of circumstances, correct? Correct. And that includes observing violent things, correct? It can, yes. And uh, in wartime, there are people who, uh, combat veterans who have PTSD based on what they've, what they've seen and not necessarily what's happened to them, correct? That is correct. Okay. So uh, in a, a domestic violence situation, there are children who have suffered PTSD or suffer from PTSD based on seeing their mother or father strike the other parent, correct? That is correct. Okay. There is ample research evidence for that. If I, I want to go back to the lie situation again, because I think we, we got on a little bit different pages and I interrupted you during a couple answers because I want to make sure we're, we're all understanding the, the hypothetical. So if somebody has information that they know to be untrue and they intentionally tell somebody else that information that they know to be untrue and at the time that they tell it, they know it to be untrue. If they're not actively in the PTSD, the event that caused the PTSD, is that something, the lie, an intentional lie of information they know to be untrue, is that explained by PTSD? It can be. Okay. And that goes back to that part I was saying earlier that you know, we're picking those pieces back up and the further we get away from the event, the better the recall is. But the difficulty is that the closer we are to the event, the more problematic the recall is. And that's, that's just the basic research that's involved with PTSD at this point. I mean, that, if I were going to hang my hat on anything, I'd hang it on that. Because that's a, there's solid research basis for that. Now, we talked about, or on direct examination, you talked about a couple specific passages from the transcripts. Do you remember those passages? Yes. And... If you need to see the transcript again, I can, I can bring that to you. Um, but the gist of those, I'm going to go to council. I'm going to refer to Exhibit 290, page 55, starting on line 2491. Do you still have the transcript up there? I do not have the transcript. Okay, I'll bring that to you. You may. Just have you go to page 55. 
line 2491. Do you see that? Yes. Now the question is, and you're just now, how come you didn't tell me this yesterday when we talked, Ezra? Right, that's the 249, 2491 and 2492? That is correct. And the response is on 2494, because I didn't, it was, it's too scary. Correct? That's what the, that's that's what the, the line. Yeah, that's exact. And you said that that would be, that could be consistent with the, I think you, I think it was termed intrusive memory, correct? Intrusive recollections could be, but what we're looking at there is and that there's that sense of terror, being terrified. Okay. Um, that also could be, and I'm not looking for a broader explanation, but just a consistent or inconsistent, that also could be consistent with somebody concealing information intentionally, correct? So this goes back to that. And is it consistent or is it inconsistent, sir? Restate the question, please. The line that was stated, the response, because I didn't, it was too scary, or it's, it was, it's too scary, that could be consistent with somebody intentionally withholding information, correct? If that's all we're looking at is just that, with no other context, correct. Okay. Now, even in the context of this case, that could be consistent with somebody intentionally withholding information, correct? That's not my opinion. I didn't ask what your opinion was. I said, is it consist could it be consistent with? I would disagree with that. Now, uh, 2499, because it was just scary, because it just was scary and I can't get it out of my head, again, that could be consistent with somebody intentionally withholding information, correct? I would, I would disagree with that. Now, Dr. Benson, you were asked to be here by defense, correct? That is correct. And you were asked to meet with uh, the defendant by the defense counsel, correct? That is correct. And you met with the defendant. Um, let me rephrase the question there. You provided, you were provided documents by the defense, correct? Yes, the hard drives that I held up. And the, the documentation that you had there was what, as far as you know, that's what was, uh, that's what you had access to because that's what the defense gave you, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and you're actually hired by the defense as well, correct? That is correct. Um, hired to do the assessments as well as provide reports? That is correct. Okay. Um, and to be here today as well? That is correct. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. All right. Any redirect, Mr. Yes, please. Thank Go you. ahead. Um, well, I'll just stay sitting. I'm tired. Uh, Dr. Benson, um, is your opinions that you've given today based in any way ba uh, on money? No. Um, I, I'm not. I want to be very clear about that. I'm not a paid hired gun. I'm not a mercenary. Again, that would be very unethical. Uh, that's not why I do this. Um, just a couple of questions. Following up, would, is it usual or typical or common, you pick the word, uh, for people who have suffered from trauma to sometimes not want to talk about it? That's very common. Is it even, again, you pick the word usual, common, typical for someone uh, suffering from trauma to perhaps even lie to get out of talking about it? It's possible. Um, and again, I want to put a caveat. It's the closer to the event. And, and by, by the term lie, I meant to say I don't remember when maybe they do remember, but they're saying I don't remember because they don't want to talk about it. Would that be common? 
it happens with considerable frequency the closer to the event that they're being questioned about it. And why is it, how is it related to the closer to the event? Because what happens at that point, I mean, I hope I've made this clear, that when a person is traumatized and overwhelmed by such an intense experience, the ability to function normally goes out the window. It takes time to put the pieces back together again. And they need, more than anything, support, love, understanding, compassion, in order to put those pieces back together. Without those things, if they're just going to be questioned directly, I mean, I think it'd be fair to say that for most of us, if somebody comes at us and says, I want that report in my desk, or I want this job done in 15 minutes, we might have a certain set of words that go through our head that are very short and to the point. But for a person who's been traumatized, that's exactly the wrong response. They don't want to be pushed or shoved or put into a corner. They want to have time to be able to feel, I have to put safety back together here. Safety is one of the most important human needs that we have dating all the way back to infancy. I have no other questions. All right, any requests? Just briefly, Dr. Benson, there's a difference between um, what's between treatment and gathering information for other purposes, correct? Oh, absolutely, yes. Okay. Nothing further, thank you. All right, okay, well, thank you, Dr. Benson. Thank you. Um, you may step down. And uh, it doesn't look like you're gonna have to come back tomorrow. For a while, I was worried you would. So, was I. Okay. so anyway, can Dr. Benson, is he free to leave? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, take your time and uh, just have a couple questions here before we, do uh, you have any additional evidence that you want to put yes, in? Yes, Judge, through uh, agreement, there are five photographs that the defense wants to enter into evidence. If you want to, I can do it now, I can do it tomorrow morning, sometime tomorrow, it, it, whenever Your Honor wants. I know time is, uh, I'll defer to Your Honor. Is there a stipulation where you don't need a witness to put them in? There's an agreement, there's going to be no objection, we can just put them in, correct. All right, well then there is uh, also one other thing that I wanted to tell the jury. There was a, uh, I believe it was the uh, Trooper Knudsen uh, video that you saw, uh, that that has been uh, put in a thumb drive and it has been marked as exhibit, is it 733? Looking through my notes. In any event, I wanted to tell the jury that that has been received in evidence. I believe that was Exhibit 705, Your Honor. 705? Yes. That's how I have written down. Yes, 705, and that is received. Okay, and then there's a stipulation related to those photographs? Yes. Seven oh six through seven ten. And uh, why don't we, uh, if you would, just give us a brief description. Oh, well, have counsel look at them first. <laughs> my, my request would be to put it on the Elmo, and I'm happy to give a description myself, but perhaps just, That's fine. Uh, or Your Honor wants to give a description. For the I don't want to, uh, however Your Honor wants to do it. Okay. Uh, is the state stipulate to the introduction of those exhibits? Yes. Okay, so exhibits 706, 707, 708, 709, and 710 will be received. And uh, I'll let Mr. Nelson, you can present them any way you wish. And I Judge, will make my notes as to what they are when you do that. Judge, the state's preference would be just to show the photos and let them speak for themselves. That's fine. All right. If Your Honor wants okay. to describe them, I'll defer to Your Honor. No, that's fine. I just want to describe them for myself. I'm going <laughs> to... First uh, publish exhibit 708, and I believe there is an agreement that the photos 
that we're showing are were taken by the crime lab as indicated on the bottom as part of the photographs of item B a vehicle uh, by Brooks Laxton of Ms. McCandless's vehicle. So that's the first photo is exhibit 708 and I think it's fair to say that they're all photographs of the back seat including the ceiling of the vehicle. Anything more on 708 no, Judge? You're good. Uh, and then putting up uh, on the screen is exhibit 709. And I just from the glare, I'm putting certain portions, so I just want to show the rest of the, the photo. And then next up is. Exhibit 710. Next up, then, Judge, is Exhibit 706. That's a, well, I mean. mm -hmm. uh, and with the permission of Ms. Nodolf, uh, we'd agree this is another picture of the ceiling that I think is the same as the previous pictures. And then lastly, another picture of the same spot, exhibit 707. point judge I'd ask just because I think there's a glare on this and whether it's today or tomorrow permission to pass these five photos to the jurors if you want to it's fine I think we have I mean we have time now I didn't know we were going to have a surplus of time I yep. thought we were going to be running short I appreciate that okay. but so can I pass these you up may. to them Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to sh very shortly excuse you for the evening, um, and uh, we've rearranged schedules again, so we are going to begin at 8.30 tomorrow um, with testimony. So we want you to be back so you'd be ready to go into the courtroom at 8.30. I believe we do have a witness lined up for at 8.30. Um, and um, I do, I, I don't think I'm going to read this entire instruction to you again today. You had it yesterday a few times and I think you understand you're not to discuss the case with anyone or listen to anyone talk about this case. Uh, don't read about it. Don't watch any coverage of this case and uh, do not do any research on your own. Don't use your devices, whatever they may be, computers, cell phones, iPads, iPods, what have you, to uh, research anything about the parties, um, witnesses, don't visit the scene or any scenes that have been discussed. And uh, anyone not recall the instruction that I read? I'll read the whole thing again tomorrow, but I don't want to have to put you through that if I don't have to, okay? All right. So again, um, it's very important that you follow these rules. Um, as again, going to the end of this instruction, these rules are intended to assure that you remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. And again, you are to decide this case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. Because you as a jurors are seeing the close-up that admissible evidence that you decide this case on. 
the danger, you listen to somebody else or some coverage, you're going to hear half-baked opinions that haven't seen the evidence, they don't know the evidence, it can be very misleading, you know, people might see bits and pieces of it and have their own opinions. There's all sorts of reasons why it's important that you just base you, your decision solely on the evidence offered and received here at trial. Okay, thank you very much for your attentiveness. We're going to excuse you for the evening. All rise. All right. Door is closed. Um, okay, anyone need a break at the moment? If I could, Your Honor, I, I know the sidebars aren't going to relate to me. Is it okay if I... Yes, certainly. Thank you. All right, so I think we only have sidebars from this afternoon at this point. Let's see. And for what it's worth, I believe the first sidebar was taken up then when we excused the jury and went through everything. So the defense has nothing to add to the first sidebar that happened prior to the uh, voir dire of Dr. Benson. Everything that we wanted to say was then put on the record after that. All right. Was that uh, one, about 1.29 p.m.? Sounds about right. Um, and uh, we had, court had received Exhibit 712. And that was his report. Well, and that's a different one. I apologize. This, I think the one you're referring to now is something that we, uh, Mr. Hahn probably wants to take up. Well, uh, there's one here I've checked off because I think we started talking about it um, on a sidebar and then excused. Uh, let's see. I apologize, Judge, but I believe I, there was a sidebar about the first sentence of Exhibit 712 on page oh, yes. 2 under the word clinical diagnosis. I just agreed to not publish that portion of the report to the jury. Um, I don't know if your honor wants to. Okay, well, take that up now. But we, we essentially agreed to not show that, and if it becomes an issue later, we can argue about it later. All right. Well, yeah, I did have a first sidebar, but uh, I think uh, we did clear that up already, and that was just about. The redaction instruction. I gave a redaction instruction, improvised basically, as counsel. I think that was related to both uh, 712 and 713. So I've already marked that as checked off. Okay, 146 was a sidebar about exhibit 712. And uh, I have uh, in quotations uh, threatened death. And uh, Mr. Hahn, anything else you want to say about that? I believe it was your request for a sidebar. It was. I'm sorry, Judge. It's on page two of that exhibit. It's uh, the first full sentence of the clinical findings at the bottom. As you recall, my report documented the presence of PTSD. Hi. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> presence of PTSD due to exposure to threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence on March 22, 2018. Uh, I expressed that that was similar to the types of statements that were previously redacted. It was something that I, I missed, and I think there's a little bit of an explanation because it falls into the category laid out in the DSM-5. Um, but it, in the way it was written here made it seem as if it had to, at least the way I read it, um, had to be presented to or onto the person having PTSD or being assessed. So it was a little bit misleading, so that's why I wanted to approach before testimony was elicited about it. Uh, Attorney Nelson simply didn't publish that portion to the jury, and I think uh, in line with that, it's something that shouldn't go to the jury later on as well. All right, and uh, Mr. Nelson, anything further you'd like to say about that at this time? Um, I think it was covered on uh, cross-examination, not that line, but that idea was certainly covered on cross-examination uh, by Mr. Hahn. Uh, I think there's no need to redact it because it accurately reports and it was covered on cross-examination. However, if your honor rules that that needs to be redacted before it can be given to the jury, jury we object, but uh, I don't need to be heard anymore on it. All right. Well, again, I do believe it was covered on, on cross-examination and it's listed as one of the criteria for in the DSM-5 for post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, so again we'll address it again if there's a request to see that exhibit at some point. Okay at 2 p.m. Uh, we started with a sidebar that's the one that ended up uh, getting fairly lengthy. Uh, court excused the jury 
and we addressed everything after the jury was excused and before they came back. And uh, there was a voir dire of uh, Dr. Benson. And uh, so that's addressed. I don't think anything else either council would like to say about that. No. Okay. Um, okay. And then the last sidebar, approximately 3.36 p.m. Uh, and uh, there was an objection on relevance, court sustained. Uh, Mr. Nelson asked for a sidebar. It was following the question, follow-up question, because I think the witness, Dr. Benson, had said, well, you know, maybe you want to cover that with uh, Dr. Hopper. He'll be coming, and he can maybe talk to that more than I can, essentially. And then the follow-up question by Mr. Nelson was, uh, you know, is Dr. Hopper, is some of the effect that Dr. Hopper's renowned or recognized expert, something to that effect. I believe, it was a, I believe my question was consistent with what I think the requirements, not that I'm trying to do that under 90308 sub 18 exception, is he a recognized authority in yes. this field? That sounds like the question. Um, I, I sustained the objection and we had a lengthy uh, sidebar. And uh, again, I, I don't know anything else you want to put on the record regarding that. Uh, before you do, I just want to say this. Um, at the time, I was concerned about the fact that the way the time was going, that there wasn't going to be any time left uh, for cross-examination today, let alone redirect. As it turned out, uh, Mr. Nelson, you did a good job of getting getting moving after that, and there was there was plenty of time. I thought the state would probably cross-examine significantly longer. And I was concerned about time. And, uh, and so anything else either council would like to say about that sidebar? I think there is a legal basis aside from this time consideration to sustain the objection as well. It was uh, a question to bolster the credibility of a future witness and uh, anything elicited after that would likely have been cumulative if it was in the ballpark of what Dr. Hopper would testify about anticipated tomorrow. Okay, and I, again, I also believe that it was uh, Sustainable on a legal basis, but the other aspects of the discussion, again, I appreciate uh, the seriousness of this for both parties, and uh, and I, I, again, I don't want to uh, undercut you, Mr. Nelson, in front of the jury, as you'd indicated. It's not the intent of the court. It's just trying to keep this moving at a reasonable pace, and uh, so, anyway, appreciate your patience, and... Uh, We'll see you in the morning. Anything else?